And I want to kind of dive into it this week. Rather than read the entire scripture, I'm going to kind of go verse by verse like I have been for the last few weeks because each passage uh, will be kind of diving in in a very particular way. Because the whole of today's scripture is going to be an exhortation, which is basically a way for us to live our life as Christians. Now, some of it's going to feel good and some of it probably isn't. And most of which doesn't feel good to us is probably because maybe we're not living up to the standard of what God has set for us. He's already set a standard for us. It's just up to us to live up to that expectation of what he set for us. Now, again, as a reminder, I never go into sermons and messages in a way of like, man, I can't, I can't wait to get to tell you there to talk about John. John is who I'm thinking of when I wrote this sermon. Man, I can't wait. Definitely can't wait to talk to John. I, think, I talk to the Christian community as a whole. And I'm talking to myself as a Christian as a whole. When I write sermons and messages, I really do think about the whole. And when I write messages... I particularly think of the Christian life and what our purpose is and what our plan is and what our ideal life is supposed to live in a way that God wants us to live. I don't have anybody in mind ever, quite literally. I just want what God wants for us. He wants us to live better. And I love that the Hebrew writer draws this out because he's looking at the Hebrews in this day, because as we've talked about a million times, literally he's saying, These guys are getting ready to walk away from their life with Christ and go back to their old way of living in the Old Testament. Which is going to be very interesting because we're going to look at that contrast today too, later on. Going back to their old life and walk away from Christ. And as most of you know, and as all of us should know, truly is the best life. A life lived for Christ is truly that best life. So let's dive into it today with a little aspect of reviewing a little bit from last week because that will add truly to our aspect for today. When we look at verses 12 to 13, I want to review those two verses from last week. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 12 read this. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weaken knees And make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be uh, desolated, uh, dislocated, sorry, dislocated and healed uh, instead. When we look at those two verses from last week, this message was clear. At least I thought it was clear. You know, we look at that, we quickly referenced that, and we look at that message and said, okay. So if we look at this dislocation aspect, if we look at this unhealed aspect of our bodies, what can be quickly healed? Well, discipline has a way of healing us in a way that we don't like, in a way that we don't particularly like at all. But it's critical. And it's a critical thing for us to understand that discipline has a way of healing all of us because it helps us on our way takes out the sin in our life. It roots it out. If we allow it. Because the sin only it maims us. It destroys our body. It destroys us in ways that we cannot fathom. So we have to, have to root it out. And sometimes that comes in a form of discipline. And you have to understand that in order to move on. You have to understand that you're God's people. And because you're God's people, there are standards. And you have to understand those God's standards. God's standards are your standards. You can't live by the worldly standards. God's discipline is on purpose. But it's because of God's standards and because of his discipline that you can live as godly people. And that is why those two verses are so important for us to understand what's going on to today. Because that is the key. Discipline allows us to take root, 
take root in his standards as he set the bar high and allowed our experiences in discipline to understand what it means to live in his way in the Christian life, in our walk with Jesus in that way. Preparing every way to root out sin. A lot of times when we look at our lives, we see sin and we don't address it. We don't want to address it. We think, oh, that's somebody else's problem to deal with. Or I won't deal with it. No one else knows it's there. So instead of rectifying our sin or dealing with our sin, we just ignore it. We think nobody else sees it, nobody else knows about it. But the Hebrew writer is telling them, everybody else sees it. (laughs) Everybody else sees it in a way that they should too. And we should as well. So take steps to rectify it. Which leads us to verse 14, the warning against rejecting God's grace. So verse 14 is this, pursue peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Do you see that? This is not the first time in scripture that we see this idea of living in peace with one another. So this idea of living with peace with one another comes in multiple different pieces of scripture. You see it in Matthew 5, 9, Mark 9, 50, Romans 12, 18, all over. The same example, live in peace with one another. But it's not just living in peace with one another like as Christians, but also with everyone, even non-believers. That is the key. Because when we live in peace with one another, the community lives in harmony. But then when we live in peace with others out in the community, the community can live in harmony. Or they learn to live in harmony, let's put it that way. But this is a secret also. And here's the secret that most churches don't want people to know. You prepared? Here's the secret, guys. From one elder to the church, Christians are selfish. And abrasive. I, I know. It almost, it, almost, it almost hurts my heart to even say it. We're fallen also. Broken sinners. The reality is, is we're just as messy as non-saved people. But we try to hide it. We try to put our Sunday best on and come to church and pretend that nothing's wrong. And most churches really try to hide that. Not us good legacy people. We're beyond that, right? But Christians are selfish and abrasive. That's the reality. And we have to try hard to still live in peace with one another. When you offend somebody, guess what? You're going to offend somebody. I tell you, I promise you, I will offend you. There'll be times I offend you, probably pretty heavily. Uh, I ain't going to lie. Um... But we must work it out. We must live in peace. We must find ways through it. Because you have to live in peace in our community. And it's going to be very important because I tell you, I had a Greek professor one time. He loved this word I'm about to teach you guys. Here's the most important part about living in peace. It's not about just living in peace. It's about living in hagias. Hagias, living in as holy. Holy. Okay, he loved this. He, he pronounced it really, pronounced his name was Fairchild. He was a really awesome guy. We weren't related, but I love that his name was Fairchild. It helped us when we were in Israel because we got the best rooms. Hagias, you got to live as holy. So not just as peace, but as holy. See, that's what separates you from everybody else. See, we're messy, we're abrasive. We're still going to mess each other up. We're still going to hurt each other's feelings. 
It's not like we're Christians. We're like, oh man, now everything's just amazing. We're always going to be like butterflies. We're never going to offend each other. Ever, ever, ever. But the reality is, is we are. We're going to be a little messy. We're going to be a little selfish. We're going to be a little abrasive. But we can still strive to live at peace. And we can strive to live hug us as holy. Because that is what separates us from other people. Because that's what makes us his people, holy. That's what actually allows other people to see him in this world. Amazing. Amazing that how do other people see God in this world? By seeing his people be hagias, holy. That's how they see God in this world. How we act in this world. When you act with non-believers, when you act around non-believers, when you act as if you are a believer of God and you truly act that way, it's because that's how they see God in this world. Had a great conversation with my son this week about the topic of how do people see God in this world. And this idea came up truly in that conversation. Before my study time, so it was awesome. So it was amazing idea connection there because people don't see God if they're a non-believer. But the reality is they do see him through you. If you are acting as if you belong to him. But a lot of people only belong to him on Sunday morning. But a lot, the reality is we are act, to live in peace as holy. Both terms, not just one. The people of this world only see him through you sometimes. Because the last portion of that verse really says, without no one will see the Lord. If we don't live in peace, we don't live in holiness. Without it, no one will see him. What about verse 15? As we continue on, make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble and defiling many verse 15 has a lot to say a lot to say you listen to those first few words again you say make sure just that first two words there now some of you may be looking at a different translation and it may say you know um do you have niv there what's your first two words say my brain just shut down uh, verse 15. See to, it that no one See to it. See to it. See to it or make sure. See to it or make sure. When we look at those two words right there. That says a lot about what it means. So that those two words right there are translated. And the, the root of that word is actually translated in a noun verb as bishop. Okay. And bishop would be a term that we use as a main elder, head elder of a church, okay, in the noun verge. So we use it as a very weird word here. It's supposed to hold each other accountable. It's meant as you as believers holding each other accountable as a church body. But how are you to do that if you're not around each other? How are you to do that if you're not with each other? It's not the typical word structure. Take a noun and then add a bunch of word thing structures to it to make this word. But it was done on purpose by the Hebrew writer because he wanted to make sure that he was talking to the church. To the church about what it means to take care of one another. Make sure that no one falls out of the understanding that grace is important. That God's grace is important. The importance of that is important. Of course. We all have to understand that and take that to heart. We must care for one another. We must love one another. We must love each other through it sometimes, which is not easy either. Because the grace of God, falling short of the grace of God is not an experience that we want any of our brothers and sisters to do. What about secondly? We don't want anybody to take root of bitterness 
take root of bitterness. Think about this, a root of bitterness, one seed, you offend somebody. And let's say they are like, oh, it didn't bother me that bad. And then a year from now, they start talking to somebody else in the community about how that pastor offended me one time before, blue, blue, blue. And then somewhere in there, and that blue, blue, blue is that other thing that I probably did one time um, ago. And, but it affects the community. That one seed that happened now has infected the community because it bears fruit somewhere else. Rather than resolving the issue, because that's what you do, you offer grace, you seek each other out, you care for one another, love one another, have peace, walk in holiness, don't let bitterness take root, but instead, people let this root of bitterness take do it and it destroys the whole community. It happens all the time. And the example of the church throws it out there. The third warning you might see is in verse 16. Verse 16, it comes out even more. And make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. A single meal. The story of Esau, um, if you remember, and if you want to write this reference down, it's Genesis 25, 39 through 34. It's where he came back. He was out hunting. He had no food. He was starving. And of course, Isaac's sitting there all prepared, had a meal. Esau came up. He's like, I'm hungry. Make me a plate of that meal. And Isaac's like, well, give me your birthright. And Esau's like, well, what good is my birthright if I die here? I'm so hungry. So he gave over his birthright just so he could have a meal. See, people think so short-sighted one time at times in life. Think right now. I got food in my belly right now rather than thinking of the spiritual things about what it means for future. What it means for the reality. His birthright is everything that has coming to him, which is all that his father has. His birthright of being firstborn. He gave it all up to Isaac. God counted as immoral because he wasn't thinking spiritually. He was thinking with his belly. He was thinking humanly. So that's the connection I want you to make there. When it, and it says Esau, now the Hebrew writer would know that the, the Hebrews would know Scripture really well. And they would tie this together really fast. That Esau was acting immoral. Now there's lots of other connections there. Another really good connection here for you parents, your young parents. One day really maybe tie a lace on this piece of Scripture here. This is a really good Scripture to tie in purity. If you want to talk about purity, it's something you can't get back. When you want everyone to talk about that conversation about purity for young parents. Because something you can't get back. The reality is, is when you're talking to young children, when you're talking about purity, you can't get that back. Which is why it's so important to wait for marriage. Right? Same thing with Esau. He can't get his birthright back. Which is why it was an immoral decision. You can't get that back. There's some things you can't get back. Now, God's always there for forgiveness. So it's not about you can't be forgiven. God's always going to offer forgiveness. But there are some things you just can't get back. So the reality is we must protect each other. There's all kinds of warnings. We must protect from grace of God, from people falling short of that, right? We must also protect them from the root of bitterness. We must also protect themselves because some people just themselves have the issue with not thinking long-term, think short-sighted. Had those interesting conversations with people this week already. People thinking short-sighted instead of long-term. And verse 16 really just, really hammers that home when you think about the example of Esau. I got any food in my belly. That can tie to so many things in our world. Verse 17 can leave a lot of questions for you. 
Let's see how many questions it might leave for you in our sermon follow-up. For you know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. Esau didn't seek repentance. He was just mad that he gave up his birthright. Now, it doesn't really get, Scripture doesn't really speak to the idea of Isaac's issue in that, that he prepared a meal waiting for Esau to come back. He didn't talk about it, any of Isaac's issue in that. He talked about Esau being so short-sighted, so immoral, so not thinking of what it means to be futuristic or what it means whatsoever, just that Esau was immoral in his thoughts. The reality is, he was offered forgiveness, but he couldn't get over the fact that he lost everything because of his stupid decisions. Know anybody like that? Know any Esau's in your life? I know a couple. Two or three. Maybe four. That verse 17 can leave a lot of questions, but never forget that God will always offer forgiveness for those who seek it. Now, this next section of verse is a lot of fun. I think it's a lot of fun, but it gives us a good reminder about Old Testament and New Testament covenant. Two different covenants, two separate ways. Make no mistake, we are under New Testament covenant. Verse 18 through 24. Let's read through it. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Instead, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the myriads of an angel's. A festive gathering to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of the righteous God made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. When you look at the section verses, there's two different connection points one which is mount sinai which is the old testament covenant and the mount zion which is the new covenant and we look at those two different things on purpose because in the old covenant which is also referenced in exodus uh like 19 and 20 if you were to go back there and read that whole story i'm going to give you kind of a snapshot of it just for sake of sermon time today But if you were to look back at that, a Hebrew writer wants them to remember the harshness of the Old Testament covenant, the harshness of the law. There's a reason the harshness is there. Now, a lot of people, they come to me like, let's say non-believers. Let's start with non-believers first. The non-believers say, well, what about those Old Testament laws? Those are some pretty harsh stuff. I don't want to serve a God that does that. And I use country Southern slang on purpose because there's no one Southern up here. No one would be offended, ish. But the reality is, he was harsh. He was teaching them the way. He was also teaching us something through the Old Testament as well. Yeah, it was really harsh. Man, some of those things were really harsh that happened. Without a doubt, Extreme harshness happened under the Old Testament law. Don't do anything on the Sabbath. I mean, nothing. And if you did, death. Yep, that's harsh. And even more extreme harshness could happen. But it taught them something. And it teaches us something. You know what it teaches you? Or taught you? or should be teaching you about sin. It teaches you what sin is. And it also teaches that sin has consequences. Because the reality is, is that the new covenant, there was consequences for sin. 
But it's also that consequences were paid in the new covenant. God will always offer forgiveness. 100%, without a doubt. But we must have knowledge of sin, right? And the Old Testament provides that knowledge of sin. In Romans 7, 7, we see Paul write this. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. But I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. If it were not for the law, I would have not known sin. Paul, a scholarly man who knew the law very well, knew what it meant to sin because of knowing the law. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we get, we get to come to God. In the Old Testament, you had to stay away from God. See the difference? If you came close to Mount Sinai, if you go back to the Genesis passage, I mean the Exodus passage, if you came anywhere close to Mount Sinai during those Ten Commandments reading, you'd be put to death. Anywhere close. A ring of fire and thunder and lightning descended on the mountain. And if you or an animal came anywhere close to that mountain, you'd be put to death during the Ten Commandments of reading. Everyone heard God's voice. So much so that they feared God. So much so that if you were like in chapter 20, that they didn't want to hear from God again. They only wanted to hear from Moses. God, please don't speak to us directly again. <laughs> this is what they're telling Moses to tell God. They only want to hear from Moses. Because when they heard God's voice, they feared and trembled. Because they heard God giving Moses the Ten Commandments while he was on the mountain. They knew what sin was because God showed them and told them what it was. And they had to stay away. But in the New Testament, we're offered right to him. Come to him. Go right to him. Jesus made the way. He paved the way. He made the way. So we go right directly to him without a doubt. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 said this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humbly, humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Big difference here. Big difference in the old covenant and the new covenant. And that difference is this. There's a massive privilege in being able to come to the Mount Zion. But that massive privilege comes with great responsibility to live out the life of being a Christian. It is a massive responsibility, but it's worth, it's worth every bit of it. Thankful for the Old Testament to teach us what it means to have, what it means to sin. Because without it, we wouldn't know what sin is. But I'm thankful I don't live under the Old Testament. And I'm sure I'm not trying to bring the Old Testament ways back into the New Testament. And for the churches that do, then let's just pray for them. Because <laughs> I don't want any part of that. Because we live in the New Testament, 25 through 29 has some really great things to say about the New Testament and the New Covenant. See to it that you do not reject the one who speaks. For if they did not escape when they rejected him, who warned them on earth, even less will we if uh, will it will if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven his voice shook the earth at the time but now he has promised yet once more i will i will shake not only the earth but also the heavens this expectation yet once more indicates the removal of what can be shaken that is created things so that what is not shaken might remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful by it. We may serve God acceptably 
and reverence and awe. For our God is consuming fire. So we will address these verses by simply saying, this is a warning for us, a reminder, a warning for us, a warning for Hebrews, however you want to look at that, that we cannot refuse him. We should not refuse him. I mean, you can refuse him. It's your choice. I mean, God gives us a choice, right? But if we do, there's a consuming fire waiting for us because that's what happens with sin. A consuming fire. It said it in Deuteronomy, just like it's referencing here, and it says it here. For all sin, there is a consuming fire. So if you look at verse 25, you cannot, warning, do not reject him. And in verse 29, 29, you fast forward, there's a consuming fire. So if you reject him, there's a consuming fire. Tie it together. Don't reject him. There's a consuming fire. Now, if you go to the middle there, if you refuse him, you reject him, and you know him, you love him, there is a consuming fire, without a doubt. Tie a couple of verses there. You have Haggai, which actually literally says, Haggai 2, verses 6 through 9. It gets the prophecy for this. For the Lord of armies says this, once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures on of all the nations will come and I will fill the house in the glory so that the Lord of the armies, the silver and the gold belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of the armies. The final glory of the house of the greater than the first, says the Lord of the armies. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of the armies. See, the reality is, is Haggai prophesied this. This has not happened yet. This is going to happen. The earth is going to shake again. And all that can be shaken will be shaken. All that is not with him. Are you a part of the kingdom that can be shaken or not be shaken? Because in Revelation 21, 4, as we've already went through before, has another declaration for you as well. As you might remember from our Revelation series. Because in verse 28... His kingdom will not be shaken. This is what you will inherit. You will inherit a kingdom that is unshakable. There is something better coming. And it's coming for you and for you to benefit with. But you must give something. See, what he's asking for is us to give our reverence and awe. It must be acceptable. But what does reverence and awe really look like? Does he want us to gum up on Sunday morning and, you know, because Sarah does a great job on leading us in worship and like, oh, thank you, God. I, I praised you today and I gave you my two songs and I sat down. Awesome. I'm telling you, if that's what you've done this week to give your reverence and awe to God, maybe you got to rethink that. Because what God wants is your heart. He could care less if you sung the two songs or not. He wants your heart. He wants your whole heart. That's what reverence and awe is. He wants your heart because your heart matters. Where your heart is, your treasure is. Because that's the treasure he's after. He's after your whole heart. Because that tells him where you are and who you're for, who you're with. That warning is so clear in this piece of scripture. And we see in other pieces of scripture, Jesus was very clear for the wages of sin is death. <laughs> very clear. The only way to heaven is through him. The only way across the chasm of death is Jesus. He's the only pathway. He's the only bridge. He's the only way. There's no other way. The Old Testament doesn't get you there. Nothing gets you there. There's no many pathways to heaven. There's no, gosh, if I follow Allah, if I follow Muhammad, if I follow everybody, if I follow all these people, if I just be a good person, none of that gets you to heaven. Only Jesus. But not just following Jesus, not just coming to church every Sunday, not just showing up, not just singing every song. Only if you gave your heart 
to Jesus. Because if he didn't give you heart, the consuming fire is coming. I don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. And it's really what we deserve. We definitely get what we deserve. As I wrap up, and I don't go too far into the, that consuming fire, because I was about to get my soapbox out. John was about to go get it for me. But uh, let me wrap up. Live a Hagios life. Live a holy life. Live one that others look to you and go, what is different about this person? Something different. Man, there's something different. I can't put my finger on it, maybe. But man, they want to know. Live a Hagios life. Live a holy life, holy life. Be watchful over one another. We live under the New Testament and the New Covenant, and it is a great responsibility. It's, it's a lot of responsibility, and sometimes it's heavy. But it's worth it. Because the consuming fire is coming for the sin. And it will consume it. It says it in the Old Testament and it says it in the New Testament. Same words, same meaning. The consuming fire will consume sin. He wants your worship. He wants your reverence. He wants your awe. He wants you. He wants your heart. He doesn't want a divided heart. He doesn't want your heart on Sunday morning. He doesn't want your heart in the mornings and once in the evenings. He wants your whole heart. So you got to give it to him. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for who you are and just so grateful and encouraged by you. Father, just, may you just give us a, all a wonderful time of fellowship. And may we just honor you with our time of uh, fellowship as we give glory to you. Father, may you just uh, use this food to nurture our body and nurture our minds. Say this in Jesus' name. Amen.